Hello, gorgeous. Do you think you can hear the difference between the cheapest vintage analog polysynth on Reverb, the Korg Poly 800, and its legendary siblings, the Korg Poly 6 and Korg Monopoly? Looking on Reverb today, I saw that you could get a Poly 800 for only $340 with shipping. Compare that with the cheapest Poly 6 and Monopoly I could find, which went for $1450 and $2100 respectively. Combine that together, and a Poly 800 costs less less than a tenth the price of those two synthesizers combined. In this blind test, I'm gonna give you three examples and you guys are gonna comment below whether you think A or B is the Poly 800. So if ye be brave, let's begin. Now, before I reveal the answer, I wanna give you guys a second to comment below which you think is the Poly 800. So you're gonna have an answer kind of like BBA or AAA or ABA, something like that. To give you guys a couple more seconds as well, I wanna explain what you're listening to. Because the Poly 800 has a stereo analog chorus built into it, I thought it would be a dead giveaway if I used the mono output Poly 6 and mono poly against the stereo output of the Poly 800. So you're only listening to one channel of the Poly 800 to make it a little bit more fair. Finally, I LUFS match the example so that they're all the same volume to keep it fair. All right, if you've left your comment below, I'm about to reveal the answers. Drum roll, please. Please like and subscribe. In the first example, B was the Poly 800. In the second, it was A. And in the third, it was also A. I wonder if you're surprised that all of that vintage analog sound came out of this little gray keyboard from 1983. This is the Korg Poly 800, and it's almost always the cheapest vintage analog polysynth from the 80s that you can get on Reverb. Like I said earlier, I saw one on Reverb today for $340 with shipping. When this bad boy launched in 83, it was the first fully programmable synthesizer for less than $1,000. The launch price was $800, which to put into perspective is just under about $2,500 in today's dollars. So even though breaking the $1,000 market barrier for synthesizers was incredible at the time, by our standards, this would still be a pretty expensive polysynth. For $800, there's an incredible amount of power and features packed under the hood here. But first, let's talk about some of the negatives that led to its ignominious reputation among synth snobs of the time, as well as to why you can get it so cheaply nowadays. Everyone knows the most important thing about how a synthesizer sounds is how it looks. So in this case, we've lost the nice wood paneling on the sides of the Poly 6 and Mono Poly. We've also lost an octave of keys, making this a much smaller keyboard. We've only got 49 keys. 
we've lost the metal enclosure and now we have just this horrible gray plasticness that doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. And most importantly, we've lost all of those knobs from those legendary synthesizers. Technically, Korg had already lost the knobs with the Poly 61, which came out the year before this. So this synthesizer, as well as synthesizers like the Roland Alpha Juno, are not winning a beauty pageant anytime soon, and therefore do not command the high prices of a vintage analog synth of its caliber from the 80s. The biggest factor that actually affects the sound of the synthesizer is that it has only one analog filter for the entire synthesizer instead of an analog filter per voice. So this is what we call a paraphonic synth as opposed to a fully polyphonic synth like the Korg Poly 6. Curiously, the Monopoly, which has only four oscillators as opposed to the eight in this synthesizer, is also paraphonic, meaning it only has one analog filter. And the Monopoly routinely sells for $1,000 more than the fully polyphonic Poly 6, which has six oscillators with six filters, one per oscillator and a sub oscillator per oscillator. Riddle me that. So what does that mean in terms of sound? Well, unlike on a polyphonic synth, where each note that's played will have its own filter with its own envelope on it dictating the shape of that sound. On the Poly 800, we only have the one filter to shape the sound of every note. Now, what that means is actually easier to hear than it is to explain. So when I play this brass patch, if I play all the notes at the same time, it's functionally identical to how it would sound on a polyphonic synth. <laughs> Parameter 46 here, the trigger is set to single. And what that means is that trigger is going to control the behavior of how the filter reacts to multiple note presses. So again, it's easier to hear than it is to explain. As I play these notes, you'll be able to hear that the subsequent notes I play do not re-trigger the envelope of the filter. <laughs> You could hear that the filter was still darker. It didn't let the sound through because there's only the one filter for the entire synthesizer. And that's a little bit less of a realistic sound than you would get from a fully polyphonic synth like the Poly 6. Conversely, if we go to the parameter 46 here and change the value from single to multi, now every time we hit a note, it will re-trigger that filter regardless of if we're sustaining notes from before. <laughs> And that's arguably even less of a natural sound. For this brass patch, it makes more sense to have a darker legato type sound here. But there are some patches where you might want the trigger to re-trigger every time you hit a note. Since I've been playing around with this synthesizer, it's made me question how often you really need full polyphony. When you're playing strings, you're usually holding down the keys, sustaining them, so that behavior is generally fine. <laughs> That's as good of a synth string sound as you're going to get. Having full polyphony wouldn't make it sound any more natural in this case. So yeah, less of a deal breaker than I would have thought before I started playing with the Poly 800. The next thing knocking some dollars off the price tag is the Poly 800 has digitally controlled analog oscillators in it, as opposed to four voltage controlled oscillators in the Monopoly or six voltage controlled oscillators in the Poly 6. So if you're watching this video, you probably already know that DCOs are completely analog oscillators. The only difference from a DCO to a VCO is that the tuning is digitally controlled. So in an era where hot analog synths were going wildly out of tune on stage, something like a digitally tuned analog oscillator was catnip to musicians' ears. Nowadays, people will say that DCOs don't breathe as much life into the sound of the synthesizer because that tight tuning prevents those oscillators from wandering in and out of tune that gives that desirable drift and chorusing. What's also interesting to me is a synthesizer like the Roland Juno 106 just totally does not have the stink all over it because it has DCOs. People love that synthesizer and consider it the hallmark of analog synthesis. It's pretty much the keystone species of the vintage synthesizer market. And yet it has DCOs instead of VCOs. And that doesn't seem to count against it. Now those DCOs can either be used to give you eight voices of paraphony. Or we could go to parameter 18 and put it into double mode. Now we've have the paraphony down to four voices, but each of those four voices now has two DCOs that we can detune to get a thicker sound. 
Now, four voices of paraffin doesn't sound that good, but when you consider that the Poly 6 only has one oscillator per voice anyways, and the Monopoly only has four oscillators, period, it's really not that bad. Now, the Poly 800 does not have an arpeggiator, it has a sequencer. In the mid 80s, that was the trend was to go away from arpeggiators and towards sequencers. Now, technically, you could sequence out an arpeggiated pattern, but you could, of course, have a much more complicated sequence. So in some sense, that is actually a pro, not a con, except for the fact that I think the arpeggiator in the Poly 6 and Monopoly are really excellent and unique because they have a range mode called full, where the synthesizer will go up as many octaves as it possibly can as opposed to just going up one, two, or three octaves. It's a beautiful sound and it's unique to the Korg Poly 6 and Mono Poly. And so I do think it's a con that it's missing from the Poly 800 just because that was such a big part of what people associated with the Korg sound at the time. Less obvious than the paraphonic nature of the synthesizer, the biggest difference for me impacting the sound and how I would use the synth is that this synthesizer can't do any sort of pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation was a common feature on a lot of analog synths at the time. Wasn't on every legendary analog synth. For instance, since the Korg MS-20 does not have pulse width modulation either. Considering the word poly is in the name of the synthesizer, it's clear they were going for that analog poly synth crowd in the mid 80s. And so it's actually pretty surprising that there's no pulse width modulation. The last thing I can think of that's a feature that's present on the mono poly, but not on the poly 800 or the Korg poly six is any sort of cross modulation or hard sync. Poly six doesn't have it because it's a single oscillator per voice synthesizer. And the Poly 800 doesn't have it either. I don't think it's really a deal breaker. It's just the last thing I could think of that is present on one of those two other synths that's not present here. Now let's talk about some of the really awesome things the Poly 800 can do and why I think this is an incredibly underrated analog synthesizer. So let's talk about these incredibly unique oscillators. The Poly 800 borrows the concept of additive synthesis from digital synthesizers, but accomplishes it entirely in the analog realm with square wave oscillators. So instead of starting with an oscillator that's full of harmonic character, like a sawtooth wave, you actually build up the harmonic content of the oscillator by stacking octaves of square waves. I believe this is accomplished using divide down technology, like what was used in 70s string machines. But instead of taking one oscillator and dividing it down across an octave, I believe it's divided down in octaves per voice which is a pretty crazy concept, and I believe this is the only synthesizer that does this. If your head's spinning from that explanation, let's just go to how it sounds. It all starts with the humble square wave, but now we can turn on additional octaves, and interestingly, we could even turn off the fundamental, to get a sort of like a reed sort of a sound. And you can hear how easy it is to build up an organ sound with the Poly 800 because it kind of has that octave -y thing going on. Now with parameter 12, which is called waveform, we can set the relative volumes of these oscillator footings. Although it says option one is square wave and option two is sawtooth wave, it doesn't actually change what the oscillator shape is. It changes the relative volume of those oscillators. So value one sounds like this with all the oscillators on. Very Game Boy-esque sound. And two approximates a sawtooth wave. What's interesting though, is you get that weird little whine at the top, which I suppose could be used as almost like a tine from an e-piano if you wanted to create that type of sound. But to me, let's turn that highest value off. Well, that doesn't exactly sound right either. If we turn the next one off, it again doesn't quite sound like a sawtooth wave. Just get these very interesting, characterful, Game Boy type sounds on the sawtooth mode with all four oscillators engaged. Basically a sawtooth, like you can hear the sawtooth in there, but you get that whine at the very high end. You don't really notice it when you're playing a chord though. Well, yeah, kind of a little bit, maybe down low. Yeah, it's definitely in there. So you'd want to shave that off with the filter, I'd think for most sounds. Anyways, parameter 18 allows us to put this into double mode. Thank you. 
And you can hear we have this wonderful detuning. Parameter 32 is the detune amount, so we could actually increase that. Which is very lush sounding. Or we could tighten that up to where there's almost no detune. Sounds really fat that way. For the first time, something this synthesizer can do that neither the mono poly or the poly six can do is create an interval between the two oscillators. So if I increase this value to seven, now the oscillators are tuned a fifth apart. I remember when I got the Monopoly, I was really excited to use the arpeggiator to cycle through the VCOs tuned to different intervals so I could get some really interesting, harmonically complex melodies going, only to realize that each oscillator has a range in octaves knob and a tuning knob, but you can't get like a fifth or a fourth or a third out of that. But on the Poly 800, you can. So we have three separate envelopes per voice with the Poly 800. We only have two in the mono poly and a lousy one envelope on the Poly 6. On the Poly 6, the filter and the amplifier share the envelope. You can kind of get around that by using the gate as the envelope for the amplifier. But if you do that, you're not going to have any attack and release on your sounds. Just when you press the keys, the sound is on. And when your fingers are off the keys, the sound is off. So you might be thinking, well, I know what two of the envelopes are doing. One's for the amplifier and one's for the filter, just like on a typical analog synth. But what's the third envelope doing? The Poly 800 actually has two tricks up its sleeve. The first is we actually have separate amplifiers per DCO with its own envelope in the Poly 800. So what that means is that the first DCO can have a completely different volume shape than the second DCO. The other trick is the third envelope is also routed to the noise. So for instance, in a sound where you're not using the envelope to control the filter, you can control the amplifier of the noise with that envelope. I set up a simple sound here with the oscillators tuned to a perfect fifth. And I just like to point out how cleverly they laid out these parameters. And it's actually not that bad to program because for instance, the attack for each of the envelopes is always the first number. So it's 51 for the first envelope, 61 for the second, 71 for the third, and everything else follows that pattern. So it's actually very quick to program. It's not as complicated as it seems. And your memory picks it up very quickly. Anyways, here's the sound. Sounds very beautiful, but probably the biggest improvement, in my opinion, that Synthesizer has over the Poly 6 and the Monopoly is the inclusion of a stereo analog chorus. So that's parameter 48. Let's turn that on and try it again. That is just stunningly lush and huge sounding. I believe this is the first Korg analog synth to have a stereo chorus. The Poly 6 had a mono output chorus phaser and ensemble. The Trident had a mono output chorus and flanger. The Poly 61 had nothing. And the Poly 800 Mark II and Korg DW8000 had a stereo digital chorus slash delay. I might be forgetting something, but I think this makes this Korg's only true analog polysynth with a stereo chorus, which is pretty incredible. Really lush and gorgeous sounding. These envelopes are all six stage, by the way, not like the typical four stage ADSR envelopes we're all familiar with. The DW8000 also have this same six stage envelope. You've got your standard attack and decay, but the decay doesn't go directly to the sustain stage. Instead, it decays to a sort of, you can think of it as like the first sustain, which is the break point. And then the slope is the decay time from the break point to the final sustain. And then you still have your typical release. So with those types of envelopes, you can create pretty complicated sounds anyways. But when you consider that you can have two different amplifier envelopes, that is one DCO can have one volume shape and the other can have a completely different one, you can get some really complex, interesting sounds not possible on any other Korg analog synthesizer. Program 31 really highlights this. So if I play quickly, we have sort of a bell sound with a little vibrato in there. But if I hold the notes down, we've got an analog string pad underneath. 
just to hammer this point home, the dual amplifier envelopes are polyphonic even if the filter isn't. You could hear how the envelopes followed the way I played those notes. Yeah, it's just a totally unique feature. Unlike on the Monopoly and indeed most synthesizers where you can blend noise into the oscillator mix, on this synth it has its own amplifier, meaning that you can shape the noise without affecting the character of the other oscillators with the filter. So typically if you were making a flute sound, you might blend in some noise to add some breathiness to the start of the flute sound and then use the filter envelope to close the filter. That way it's not breathy the whole way through and you get that more flute type sound. But of course that filter is going to be affecting the oscillators as well. In this case, the envelope is only affecting the amplifier of the noise, which gives this really convincing sound. Again, something the Poly 800 can do that not many other analog synthesizers from this era could. Probably most important to the modern musician is that this synthesizer has MIDI. This was the first Quark synth with MIDI. The Poly 61 launched without it and they later added it in. But it's so convenient to be able to use this and send MIDI out of the synth or send MIDI from a sequencer into it. At the time, this was really cutting edge stuff. However, it doesn't receive sysx, so you can't use MIDI to program it. It just sends and receives MIDI note on and off data. You can invert the filter envelope, by the way, just like you can on the Poly 6 and Monopoly. So yeah, I think I've covered most of the features of the Poly 800. We can blend the DCOs with different level amounts. The LFO, or what Korg called the modulation generator during the early 80s, has a speed. It has a delay, just like on the Poly 6. And we can send that to the oscillators or the filter, but not the amplifier. You might see a Poly 800 Mark II hanging around on reverb. And the biggest differences, aside from the paint job, is that the envelopes have a exponential shape as opposed to a linear shape. So it's going to sound a little bit more of an amp analog shape to the digital envelopes, as well as they removed the gorgeous analog chorus from the Mark II version and added the digital delay slash chorus from the DW8000, which sounds great. But for me, when I'm buying a vintage synth from the 80s, if I can get it with an analog chorus, that's phenomenal. Nowadays, we all have digital chorus plugins that can basically do what the digital chorus on the DW8000 did. So yeah, in general, I'd recommend for people to get the Poly 800 Mark I, but there's certainly some people that would benefit from the Poly 800 Mark II better. And by the way, if you want a great sounding chorus plugin that's full of vintage character, you can download Inktomi, the plugin I made, for free. The link is in the description of this video. And yeah, overall, I was just shocked at how incredible the synthesizer sounds. I was expecting it to be in that you didn't spend quite enough money for it to sound good category, like some of the cheaper Casio and Yamaha DX synths, but that's not the case at all. The paraffiny didn't bother me nearly as much as I thought it would. And to me, this would be my recommendation for any musician who wants to add that 80s analog flair into their sound, but cares more about the sound than having hands-on control or the looks of the synthesizer. Honestly, I found the programming to be very approachable. And yeah, I'm very excited to see what your guys' guesses were on the blind test, as well as what you think about the Poly 800 in general. I think it sounds really great. It's really made me question if there's any point coveting expensive analog synthesizers from the 70s and 80s when you can buy a Poly 800 so affordably and it's gonna get you that sound 95% of the time in stereo. So I wanna hear from you guys. What do you think about the Korg Poly 800? Do you think it's one of the most slept on synthesizers of the 80s or does it deserve its bad rep? Here's a link to a live stream I'm going to do that'll be a much deeper dive into the Poly 800. We'll check out all the presets as well as do an in-depth tutorial on all the synthesis and sound design possible with the synth. Continue to be excellent guys and I will see you there.